Good morning and welcome to this event, which invites musicians, teachers, students, and everyone interested to think and discuss together musicians in society and society in musicians. My name is Tuulik Kilais. I am Academy Research Fellow here at the Sibelius Academy Uni Arts Helsinki. I teach and do research here. We will have the first half of this event in English um, until 12 o'clock. And then after the lunch break, we will continue here uh, in Finnish. However, the interpretation in English is available on Zoom. So you can also join in Zoom with your phone and headphones and stay here in the hall if you wish. If you have any questions during the event, you can ask me or my co-researcher Taru Koivisto, who is sitting over there hosting the Zoom participants. And you, the audience, will also get a chance to participate today by asking questions from our guest speakers. And also during the lunch break in the lower foyer by participating in a little uh, community workshop. This event is the opening event of my Academy Research Fellowship project, performing the political public pedagogy in higher music education, funded by the Research Council of Finland. This four year project aims to expand the notion of the political in music professionalism by advancing ecological artistic imagination and transformative systems thinking within higher music education. By addressing the need to consider the political ontology of music performance, the project aims to initiate and explore alternatives for future music professionals to survive and thrive in today's uncertain complex societies. The project also aims to challenge the hierarchical relationships between the artistic and social purposes of music and expand the ecological, ethical and political boundaries of music professionalism. Musicians often encounter different fixed dichotomies in their field, including instrumental versus autonomous value of music socially impactful music versus performing music for knowledgeable audiences, or socially engaged versus artistic professional territories. This project takes as its starting point that these dichotomies don't need to be viewed as competing priorities, but as professional possibilities for combining artistic tradition, creativity, and imagination with the ability to respond dynamically to rapidly changing societal needs. We believe that this change of perspective in the mental models of music professionalism cannot happen only through internal discussions within higher music education, but demands that the musicians work, position, and social responsibility are brought into the public sphere. The border crossing between the depoliticized and the socially responsible music professionalism takes place between the institution and the public sphere, between the high culture and popular culture, and between the political and the pedagogical aspirations. Therefore, in this project, we will generate and explore participatory public artistic pedagogical interventions with the Sibelius Academy students, teachers, and actors from other fields of society. Sibelius Academy educates future performing artists in classical music, jazz, folk, and global music, and music technology. In addition to teaching musical skills and knowledge, music programs must also include educating about the social and ethical dimensions of musicianship that can be embraced, for example, 
through music making in different settings or experimenting with interdisciplinary work. Introducing different contexts and forms of collaboration opens up diverse possibilities for bridging artistic imagination with societal needs and interests. Higher education programs can and should provide arenas for young musicians to explore these possibilities. Therefore, while today's topic concerns all musicians as potential public professionals who can significantly impact society, the specific focus is on higher music education programs, their future needs and transformative possibilities. European music scholars have suggested a vision of the musician as a maker in society. This connects musical artistry and practical experience with community engagement. On the one hand, this vision challenges the modernist ideal of a performer whose task is merely to communicate the music to his audience as a sufficient form of public engagement. On the other hand, this vision also challenges the uncritical understandings of the social benefits of music making. These taken for granted assumptions present a highly idealized vision of the so-called power of music, music as a universal language, or music education as a source of salvation for disadvantaged groups. Therefore, it is crucial to identify the potential of music in social transformation while simultaneously navigating the different power hierarchies, inequalities, and political ambiguities within music practices. Some may associate the idea of musicians as, as public professionals with activism. There are several examples of how activism can take creative forms for social change in and through the arts. Unfortunately, in our fast-paced digital age, activism might also appear as non-strategic, individualistic, or as slacktivism, which involves only minimal effort or commitment within social media. Consequently, activism within higher education is considered not only an ambivalent concept, but also unrelated to professional education, leading to underestimating the potential of academic activism in strengthening the university's role in society. This is not to say that all students and teachers should become activists. However, as public performers, all musicians can be seen as civic professionals who have responsibility to navigate the political in and through music performance. Hence, it is central to revisit and recapture the idea of the political as a basis for new music professionalism in a world in which both narrow perspectives on artistry and nominal forms of activism are insufficient. The political aspect of higher music education reaches beyond the questions of personal opinions or advocacy toward societal engagement as part of institutional practices. It can manifest through how political awareness and social ecological responsibility are considered as part of music studies, performance practices, and so on. The political in performance is not only limited to community art, activism, or creative struggles for social justice. The political in performance also manifests in how any performance may perpetuate hegemonies and power hierarchies. In this way, even when artwork or music performance is said to be not political, unintentional dimensions may become visible when the performance is viewed critically and in broader sociocultural contexts. 
Therefore, it is better to engage with the political contingencies in music professionalism already as part of the studies, rather than try to maintain a pretended de-political stance on music. When we acknowledge and embrace the political ontology within music performance, new questions emerge for higher music education. Should the students follow prescripted institutional norms of musicianship uh, or per performance practices, or should they proactively challenge them? Should the teachers support students who want to change these norms as part of their artistic growth? Should the leaders protect the institution from critical socio-political issues or actively disturb the status quo within the institution? In this project, we will explore the ways in which all academic, artistic, and pedagogical thinking and action within higher music education programs unavoidably intertwine with the ecological, social, and political events outside the university in the world where the students live their everyday lives and where they will serve society as future professionals, artists, and citizens. Hence, the task of higher music education is not only to provide the highest level of disciplinary tuition, but also to connect education with societal, political, and global dimensions and tensions. Hopefully, today's presentations, performances, and discussions will support envisioning this endeavor together by asking questions and embracing possibilities towards new professionalism. And next, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Gert Biesta. Gert Biesta is one of the most prominent educational theorists of our time. He's a professor of public education at the Center of Public Education and Pedagogy, Maynooth University, Ireland, and a professor of educational theory and pedagogy at the Moray House School of Education and Sport, University of Edinburgh, UK. He's known for his philosophical work on the relationship between education and democracy and the public role of education, as well as the current positioning of teaching and teachers within society. A couple of years back, we started a collaboration with a group of international music education researchers and Gert Biesta, and the results of this collaboration will be out quite soon in the upcoming book, The Transformative Politics of Music Education. In today's talk, Professor Biesta will discuss public pedagogy in music and music education as a way to find a middle ground in the spectrum of the considerations of music and aesthetic, uh, music as aesthetic and music as political. Welcome. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, good morning. It's a nice place to be, but of course the light uh, shines only on me uh, for now. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's, I think as with music, you can have a brilliant career, but each time you step on the stage, you still have to make it work in that moment. So let's see uh, what, what we can do uh, this morning. Um, I've got a, a long title, Public Pedagogy in Music and Music Education on Attention, Plurality and the Fear of Teaching. And when I came up with that title, I thought I, I need to leave many options open and not yet decide what I will talk about. And then, of course, when I started working on the presentation, I was thinking, how can I bring this all together? Um, so I think it's also really good that this is the start of a, a four year project um, because there are some really big questions on the table. Uh, challenging questions, how to understand the political nature of musicianship, 
how much do educational programs make space for societal engagement within music education, and what then is this whole uh, idea of uh, public pedagogy. Um, so, yeah, it, as I said, it's good that we are at the, the start of a long exploration of these questions. So I'll, I'll share a few of my own uh, thoughts on this and hopefully they are helpful for the, the further work. Um, I do work in education and see myself as an educationalist, so I will pursue an educational angle and, and see how far we get uh, with that. Um, <clears throat> It starts with the, the question that Tuliki also referred to, what is this relationship between music and, and politics? Um, and also in the book, we, I think I need to point there, um, we use a very helpful distinction between political music and politicized music. Uh, I always forget which one is which, but the, the distinction is an important one um, because you can't say one way in which to connect uh, music with politics is to use music to advance particular agendas and ideologies. Now, when the agendas sound good, you can say, yeah, that's worthwhile doing. What can music contribute to social justice, inclusion, democracy? But we know that that's not the only way in which music and, and the political and values have been connected. Uh, music also does great work for nationalism, for exclusion, xenophobia. Uh, there is fascist aesthetics that, that also uh, does very problematic things with music. So you can say this is a way in which you politicize music, but then music itself very quickly begins to disappear. But taking music itself seriously, and for me that has also been one of the important insights in, in coming to Helsinki and, and working with you, to take music seriously doesn't mean that there is nothing political at stake. And that's the other important turn. Now, when I was working on this, I was summarizing that by saying, don't forget that music is not just aesthetic in the narrow sense. But then I was thinking, wait a minute, actually, music should be aesthetic because when I hear the word aesthetic, I always also hear another word, anesthetic, and for me, these two words indicate something where you can say if music is aesthetic, it, it has a quality of awakening the senses, whereas if music is anesthetic, it just produces slumber and disattention. And for me, here there is an important educational theme which is also a political theme. And what I want to do in my talk is to pursue this educational theme and show how it also has political significance. That's the plan. But to see that the, the idea of aesthetics as opposite to anesthetic, as a political and an educational theme, very helpfully brings the idea of public pedagogy into the conversation because the, the literature that uses the idea of public pedagogy is precisely intended to show interconnections between education and the political. Now, when you look at that literature, um, there is a quite big literature on public pedagogy that uses this idea as an analytical category by pursuing this question, how media, culture, society function as educative forces, um, how they shape ways of thinking, being and doing. Uh, and a lot of the analyses here also highlights how 
a lot of this is happening behind our backs. Uh, Henry Giroux in, in North America has done an awful lot of work here, particularly analyzing popular culture and saying, what actually are the messages that, that are emerging here and how are they in a sense teach people uh, whether they know it or, or not. As an educator, I'm interested in another dimension of public pedagogy. Public pedagogy as a programmatic idea, you could say as a way of doing education, but not doing education within educational institutions. But you can say doing education on the street, doing education in the public sphere. And that raises the question that you also already introduced. What does that mean for musicianship? If you think of musicianship through public pedagogy um, and ask um, how musicians, you can say, might do education in the public sphere, how music can be a form of public pedagogy. Um, and that's an interesting question. I think it, it gets at least in one way to the whole question of the, the political and the political performative in relation to music. <coughs> But then the question is, is it desirable to do education? And here I want to play a little, but also show some ideas about this whole question of how, how desirable is it to, to educate? First of all, to educate and then to educate in the public sphere and how possible is it? And here, when I look at the history of this discussion, and it has quite a long history, um, I notice something which here I call didactophobia, um, which is just a funny word for the, the fear of teaching. And I think there is actually quite a long history where people have doubts about the educational gesture, the teacherly gesture. They have doubts about the possibility of the gesture, and they have doubts about the desirability of that gesture. Is it a good thing to do, and can it be done? And I want to, to take that up a little bit. Um, one big doubter in the history of uh, education is Socrates who uh, on the one hand is often referred to as a, as a very interesting teacher, but then Socrates says, I cannot teach anybody anything. And he says, I can only make them think. And probably you've heard of Socratic teaching or you've known examples of that where Socrates is in a conversation and he asks all these kind of little questions to the student. And then at some point there is a conclusion. Now, when you see how Socrates actually does that, I think we shouldn't trust Socrates on his word, because through this strategy of all these little questions, he always gets the student where he wants the student to go. So it's actually quite a, a strange thing to say Socratic teaching is very open. It's a very particular strategy. But here already you can see some doubts and hesitations about is teaching actually possible? But also, is it desirable what's happening here? Another really important voice in this discussion is Paulo Freire, who is known for explicitly connecting education and the political. His fear of teaching, I would say, is also a fear of the teacher or the position of the teacher. His, I think, most influential book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is, for example, known of the critique of what he calls banking education, where he says what is bad education, that is where we simply sort of think that as teachers we can deposit knowledge or information in our students, and that is all we should do. 
just as he says, we put money in a bank, we think that education is to put knowledge into students. And he not only doubts whether that is possible, but he also says, as soon as we do that, the student can only exist there as an object for us as teachers. And therefore, he makes quite a strong statement <clears throat> where he says, education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction. So he calls it a contradiction, that teachers and students are together, but that the teacherly gesture seems to be one where the teacher is in control and the student disappears. He says we should do that by reconciling the poles of the contradiction, if you can sort of follow what he has in mind, so that both are simultaneously teachers and students. Um, how I understand Ferrer is that he says, actually, I feel very uncomfortable in the, the teacher position, in opposition to students, and I think we should mix these roles. But again, you can see there is a fear of teaching here. It can go even further. In Germany in the 1960s, a whole movement uh, emerged called anti-pedagogic, anti-education. They were not only critical of teaching, but they said the whole idea of education is flawed. We need to get rid of it. This is the famous book from Eckhart von Braunmull, Studien zur Abschaffung der Erziehung, Studies on the Abolishment of Education. Um, and these, these people were really quite radical, so they said, we no longer want schools, but of course we still have children and we need to do something with children. So they actually started up in Berlin something called uh, Kinderladen, children's shops, they called them where sort of children could go so that they weren't too much of a nuisance during the day. Um, it's quite worrying when you read the, um, the, the stories of these children uh, when they grew up, and they, they said this was not a very helpful way to, to enter the, the world. This is a nice poster that says, education should not happen here, Erzien verboten. Um, so this, this fear of teaching, this fear of education is quite prominent. Now, just as an aside to have a, a more complete picture, there are also people who actually have no fear of education at all. They go in the opposite direction. And one recent example of that, which I find quite stupid, to be honest, can I say that? Yeah. Um, <coughs> It's called direct instruction, which is going through a number of countries at the moment. In the Netherlands, a lot of people are very excited about it. And they just say, if teachers just do their job and do it well, explicit, intensive, focus on the material, keep things going, then everything will be fine. And you can say, yeah, everything will be fine, but what actually will be fine? This only makes sense, and only it makes a little bit of sense, if we think that as teachers we already know where sh students should end up. Now, if that's the only job of education, I think education itself becomes very trivial. So what is happening in this whole discussion? And I'm going into the discussion because my, my question is, can musicianship be thought as an educational gesture and a political gesture. The whole fear of teaching comes out of a, a concern that teaching is a process of control. And some people say, yes, that's a fantastic idea. We need more control in education. We need more control in schools. And I see that uh, a lot where people make this case uh, the whole neoliberal education machine, to, to put it quickly, goes in that direction by saying we need to have clear learning outcomes and then we need to have effective methods to go there and to measure everything. But the people who, I think, understand education because they have been in classrooms and they know 
that education never works if we just bake it into a, an attempt at control. They say teaching as control is the very thing that education should not aim for, because as educators, we should be interested in the freedom of our students. To put it very blunt, we, bluntly, every teacher wants to get rid of their students, in the good sense that they want their students to lead their own life, to do their own stuff. They are temporarily there, but then you have to say to students, it's over to you. Um, <clears throat> so this didactophilia, this idea that we should think of teaching as control, I think is only it occupies a very small area of education. I think for driving lessons, it's fine that we work clearly towards a, a predefined outcome and we do that fast and quick, that's fine. But uh, a Sibelius Academy is not a driving school. It has a completely different quality or should, it should have it. So, didacto, uh, I think I've made my own mistake here. So, didactophobia is the limit case of education. And you can say didactophilia, the fear of teaching, is of course an understandable response to this idea of teaching as control. But it is a, a response that has problems because it gets in sort of a black and white or a, a binary um, and therefore something disappears. You could say it throws out the baby with the bath water. And this has something to do with the fact that the the big response to teaching as control is to say, let's turn to learning. And this has been going on a lot over the past decades. I've coined a word for it, the learnification of education, which you can see at least at the level of the, the change in language, that students are called learners, schools learning environments, classes learning communities, teachers facilitators of learning, adult education, lifelong learning. So this whole rise of, of a, a language and a, and a logic of, and a focus on learning has been one response to the fear of teaching as control. And what you see in that development is that teachers begin to, to disappear. And there was a lot of critique of the, the teacher as the sage on the stage, which rhymes nicely. Uh, and then some people say, no, the teacher should become a guide at the side. And then I heard a nice one who said, no, the teacher should become the peer at the rear. So you see the teacher disappearing and you can begin to wonder also physically what kind of empty space that actually leaves. This move is based on the assumption that teaching can only be control and that if we get rid of teaching that we will have learning and that learning is, is freedom. Um, and what I find remarkable, and still these are steps to work towards this, this point, is that so quickly this opposition is created that teaching must be a matter of control and that therefore learning must be a matter of freedom. But when I look at a lot of, um, how shall I call it, learnified education systems, um, schools that say it's all about learning, I also don't see a lot of freedom because learning itself becomes a, a task and a demand for children and young people. But for me, the question is, can teaching occupy a different position than just the position of control? And that is important for the public pedagogy of music, because if we can only think of pedagogy as a form of control, then music becomes a, a problem in that sphere. Um, I mean, these are all my questions, so I just hope that you find them interesting, but one book I published a couple of years ago is precisely meant to, to say there must be a third option in which we rediscover teaching differently. So the question is, is there a different teacherly gesture conceivable? I think there is, 
And one way to get into that is, is with this little uh, story, um, which comes from a, a scholar in Germany, Dietrich Benner, who I rate very highly. Um, and he has written an influential book, Allgemeine Pädagogik, a, a sort of a, a book, an introduction to the whole field of education. And at the beginning of the book, he asks a really fundamental question. Does education make a difference? Does the work we do as teachers and educators, does it add anything? Does it is, is it of significance? But he asks that question in a, a very intriguing way. <clears throat> um, because he says, we know that human beings are living beings, natural beings, so they are born with talents and capacities and, and potential. We also know that human beings grow up in social and cultural environments that have a big impact on how they develop and, and grow and become. So he says there is a nature part and there is a nurture part. And then he asks, and what about education? What does the work of education add to that? And you can play with percentages or fractions and say what, what percentage should we put on each of those? You could say we should each have a fair share, but that's not how it works in the universe. And over time you see different views. There are times when people are very optimistic about education, so they would put a high percentage there. There are times that people say, actually, the social environment is tremendously influential. I think over the last decades, a lot of literature pushes to the nature side and says a lot of it is already genetically pre-programmed and we can do a little, but not that much. So if you see what, what Banner is asking, um, he comes up with a, a really interesting answer. And I want to show that in a minute. Um, but I often use two little vignettes to, to give it a, a bit more depth. Um, the first is this one. This is Rosa Parks, who uh, in 1953 or 54 boarded a bus in Lincoln, Alabama. And in the bus were these signs, I don't know whether you can read it, white forward, colored rear. Uh, and the story is that when she was asked as a colored person to move to the back of the bus, that she refused to do so. Now I do quite a lot of policy work in education and big policy discussions in many countries are very much influenced by PISA. And Finland also has a troubled history with, uh, with PISA, I think. And out of that frame, we often hear the first task of all education is to make sure that children can read. And they can say this is very odd because there is a very clear message in the bus, but Rosa Parks doesn't pick up the message. So something must have gone wrong here. Rosa Parks cannot read. So she must be a case of educational failure. That would be the PISA way of thinking about it. And this is my other little vignette. This is Adolf Eichmann, who was responsible for the logistics of the concentration camps. Very bizarre job, if you think of it. He fled to South America and then was caught by the Mossad and brought to uh, Jerusalem and put on trial. And one interesting thing about Eichmann's trial is that when he was asked Eichmann, are you responsible for the consequences of your work? He said, no, I'm not responsible because I was only following the orders of the people above me and I was acting according to the values of the society I was living in. And there you can say, here we have the perfect citizen. This is educational success, someone who obeys all the rules and lives to the values of society. And again, when you look at big discussions about citizenship education, it often says this. We need to teach young people the values of our society and the, the rules and regulations. Now, these two vignettes are interesting in light of what Banner is, 
is saying to his own question, the question, what is the contribution of education? Does education make a difference? Um, Abena gives a remarkable answer where he says, we can disagree about the percentages, but nature and nurture together are always 100%. Um, you can say that's true for Rosa Parks and for Adolf Eichmann. They are the outcome of a particular mix of nature and nurture. And there is something odd about this. The first time I read it, I was confused because I thought, he is a professor of education writing a book on education, but where is education? But the brilliance of, uh, of Benner's answer is that he says, as educators, we are interested in a different question. Not the question of this mix of nature and nurture, which of course exists, is undeniable. But our question is, how out of that mix that works differently in each of us, an I can be called forward. And he says the question of education is therefore of a different order. And I find that helpful in also to to see that teaching can exist in a very different terrain from control of, or just letting everything go. So here, Banner is pointing at teaching, a teacherly gesture, a pedagogical gesture that sort of cuts through all the discussions about development and growth and cultivation. He uses again a very nice German phrase where he says, teaching is an, an act of what he calls Aufforderung zur Selbsttätigkeit, which literally translates as a summoning to self-action. That is not to say to students, just be yourself and be happy with that, but it's to, to say, be a self. Be a subject, not an object. Be a person. Or in very simple language, the teacherly gesture that Banner is, is talking about is one where we knock on the door of our students and we ask, is anyone there? And that question, is anyone there, that suddenly flips how we can look at Eichmann and Parks. Because the most remarkable thing I still find about Eichmann is that when he was asked, Eichmann, do you carry responsibility? He said, no, because there is no one here. I am just a function of my society. I'm just a function of the orders I get, but I occupy no place in it. And Parks, in a sense, did the opposite by saying, look, I understand how this society works. I know where they want me to go. I know that if I stay put, I will get arrested. But here am I, and I no longer want to be part of such an order. Um, and here you can begin to see that if you, you have another sense of the educational question, then suddenly it gains a, a very important political significance, I would say. Someone else who understands this well, it, it's a beautiful quote I came across, is Zelensky, who in an interview um, early in the war, he was offered the opportunity to, to leave the Ukraine. And then he says, if I left Ukraine, I would be alive, but I would no longer be a person. And to, to work with that distinction, to say, of course, yeah, I, I can be alive, but when I walk away from this, this question that has been thrown into my, my life, when I walk away from that, I deny my own personhood, my own existence as subject. So the fact that the word person appears here is interesting because a person is very different from an individual. In the, the literature, in education, person is defined as the way in which the individual tries to exist. 
And then you can say, if we are only concerned about this mix of nature and nurture, we are only interested in how students become individuals with their talents, with their skills. But if we bring in this other educational question, there is still the further question, what will each individual do with how they have become? How will they try to exist? So this for me is the, <coughs> the different teacherly gesture that does something different in education than just to say either teaching is control or teaching is something we um, should leave behind and just turn everything to learning. Now it is important to see that precisely this question of what our students will do with their lives, what the students will do with all the knowledge and the skills and the, the things they have acquired, that is a question for them. That's not the work we can do for them. So the teacherly gesture here is now for one that can produce the personhood or the subjectness of students. German scholar says this very nicely, the self is the work of the self. And that both sounds very simple, but I think also very profound. That's the work for each of us to, to figure out. So the question is, is there anything we can do in this domain? You can say, do we have possibilities as educators to bring this question into play, to bring it to the attention of our students? And here again, another little idea is that you can think of should we develop very particular curricula or activities, but it starts at a, a much more simple level because it has something to do that can be found in the form of teaching. And again, someone uh, recently commented on my work and, and said, you always refer to Germans. Uh, so here is a, another scholar from Germany, but I think in Germany they, they get something of these, these questions. Um, Klaus Brange, who has written really important work in which he says everything in education starts with the form of teaching and the most basic form of teaching is that teaching is an act of pointing. The German word is zeigen, which you can translate both as pointing and showing, but you can say in pointing to something you try to show something. He even says very nicely that therefore teaching is manual labor, in German handware. You need a hand, you need a finger to point, so he says, if you don't like the finger, you shouldn't become a teacher. And of course, we have this finger, but we also have this finger. So what is in the act of pointing? You can say it has something to do with attention. We're trying to capture the attention of, of students. And we have a lot of technology to capture attention. This room is a wonderful example of an attention machine, you could say, because it's very uncomfortable to turn around and sit in the other way in your chair, so it all goes here. We also have a, a system called PowerPoint, where we have the word point as well, so it's interesting that we have all that to capture the attention. Now, of course, we are all free human beings, so we can take care of our own attention, but the only thing that we cannot do ourselves is to to move our attention in a way in which we're not going. And that's another way to think about what is teaching. That's the art to redirect someone's attention. To say to a student, yes, you're, you're going wonderfully in that direction, but wait a minute, have you ever thought of taking some steps in that direction? Have you ever thought of paying some attention to that? That you can say is the form of teaching. Um, and there is always a double gesture in it, because it's never just to say, look there, but it also goes back and say, you look there, you look there, you go there, you spend time with this. So pointing in that sense points both to the world outside of the student, 
and back to the student. So of course we can fill this with curricula, with activities, with, with programs, but at the heart of it lies this form of teaching as a matter of redirecting someone's attention. Now Pange says teaching focuses attention, and you can see teachers are really good at that. He is a bit more strict and says teaching also demands attention, and you could say yeah, we shouldn't waste our time when we get together in education, so there is a demand. But Pang is also absolutely clear that as teachers we can never enforce the attention of our students and we can never control their attention. So even if everyone is sort of looking at the same screen, what you're doing with that, I have no idea. And I also am not interested in that in a very fundamental sense because if we want to go that close then very quickly teaching comes back and becomes an enactment of control um, because yeah if you want to control the attention you need to begin by fixing the head of the student for example which already looks awful there are also researchers who do eye tracking research and they say we need to track where the eyes of the students are going and I think that that is unethical to begin with and therefore you can say pointing is a weak technology an open technology and that matters because it means that in the gesture of pointing there is already a concern for the freedom of the student and again, this is beautiful about what Pranger does, that he says, freedom is not some kind of value that we need to put on education to say it matters. He says, just look, when teaching happens, there is always this, this openness, and that's really important there. Now, freedom is a big word, um, used and abused a lot. So what kind of freedom are we talking about? Not, I think, the freedom to just do what you want to do. That would be odd to, to say as a teacher, yes, I, I try to catch your attention onto something and then I don't care. That would be just a step too far. You can say in the, this teacherly gesture there is an invitation to, to use your freedom to attend to the world that comes to your attention. And then you can say, what is this world? Well, that world is not just a set of opinions. What happens in the world matters and may ask something of us. And for me to, to bring that question at the heart of education is quite important as well. So this is not an easy freedom that comes into play. Levinas uh, calls it a difficult freedom because it's the, the freedom to do what only I can do. And I find that a fantastic phrase. Um, if you want to remember anything from this morning, maybe that's a good one. But it's this freedom to do what only I can do. In all this, and that's, I think, my, my final point, it really matters that we understand that education has a triadic or triangular structure. That there are always three elements uh, needed. A teacher, a student, and you can say something that is in the attention. And this, for me, helps to explain what the problem is with, with the, the fear of teaching and the turn towards learning because that always thinks that education is a dyadic staging with only two partners in the room, a teacher and a student. Now, if that's the staging, then of course, either the teacher ends up in this control position, where Frere also says, I, I don't want to be there as a teacher. Or the other option is that you say, remove the teacher and let's just learn together. But you can say the beauty of, of not forgetting that education has these three elements is that teacher and student attend to some 
thing. And the something that comes to the attention, that you could say is what really matters. You could say if there is any authority in a classroom, it's never the authority of the teacher, because that ends up in power and in big problems. But it's the authority of the thing that is on the table, the thing that asks for our attention. If you want to read a book about that, um, I've developed these ideas in a book called World-Centered Education, where I say that's where the center of education should be, in that what we try to, to bring to our attention. So that then brings me back to public pedagogy, and I, I hope you can sort of see the odd way in which I try to move to, uh, back to the question where I started. Because if, if we ask, is there a, a performative politics in, in music? Is the work of music not just m music, but has it got an, an educational potential? Can there be an educational gesture that is also a, a political gesture? You can now begin to see that, that maybe public pedagogy can, can speak to that. In work I've done in the past, I've made a distinction between three different sort of forms of public pedagogy or three ways in which you can interpret public pedagogy. So I want to contribute that as well, just to put it on the table and see, is that useful? One form of public pedagogy is what I call pedagogy for the public. And I would say this is bad public pedagogy, so I've already given it away. That is to think that the, the public act of pedagogy should be a matter of instruction and control. It's telling the public how it should be, how it should think, how it should act. Um, and of course, we see that a lot. I see it a lot in, in, in schools, in citizenship education that says we need to teach these young children how to be and to think and, and to act. But it's always a gesture of control. Politicians do that as well in the direction of society. Activists can do that in all kinds of, of ways. But it always comes with a too strong message that says it should be like this or you should be like that. And what it does immediately, it, it erases plurality. It says there's only one way to go. It therefore erases the public sphere because it says you don't need this fear to be in conversation. Just follow the, the message and therefore it undermines democratic politics. So if this is public pedagogy, you can say there is nothing pedagogical and nothing public in it. Now you can go to a different modality, which I call pedagogy of the public, and I see Paulo Freire moving here, for example, and other people who say, yes, let's base it on communities and collective learning processes. Um, and you see a lot of this also happening in relation to questions of plurality and diversity and difference to say, these are learning questions, we need to learn about the other, we need to learn from the other. What you see happening there, and it's not entirely bad, but still I, I worry about this. Um, you see that, that democracy is brought under a, a regime of, of learning. So it begins to say, in order to, to act and exist democratically and politically, there is a learning task for you to do. One problem here is that it gives up on pedagogy. It says, actually, pedagogy has no role. It's just the public that learns together. I also wonder whether all democratic problems are actually learning problems, so there is a discussion to be had there, and hopefully in the project you will explore some of this uh, as well. And you can even say, does learning actually lead to democratic action or democratic being? Uh, because there is quite a lot of literature on learning about the other, learning from the other, uh, but some of that learning has, has no effect in the domain of politics. So 
therefore, the, the idea of public pedagogy that I still find most attractive is to say it's not instruction, it's not learning, but it's, it's work that's interested in publicness. There you can say it takes pedagogy seriously, but precisely not as an act of control, but what I've tried to do in my talk is to say there is a different pedagogical gesture, a different teacherly gesture. Precisely this Aufforderung zur Selbsttätigkeit, this Aufforderung, this invitation, this summoning to attend to the world and to keep coming back to the question, okay, if, if we manage to focus our attention, what's the question we're facing there? That, for me, is what I had in mind when on the second slide I said we should take aesthetics seriously because aesthetics in opposition to anesthetics is, first of all, an educational move. Our job is to, to keep our students awake, you could say. It's also a democratic move because democracy requires that we don't fall asleep. And I think it's an artistic move if we understand the power of the art in this kind of aesthetic way. And then I keep coming back to another little sentence I carry with me. It's from an essay by Marber, Martin Buber on education, where he says, what's the task of education? And he's not saying it's to make sure that your country scores high in PISA. It's, he says, to, to maintain the pain and to arouse the desire. And again, this is quite mysterious. It's a little sentence that, as I said, I carry it with me. I've been carrying it with me for years. To maintain the pain is, is, is one way precisely to work in the domain of aesthetics, to say, yes, life can be hard. Existence can be painful. But that's the whole point of existing. And if we take that pain away, then in a sense we take the existence out of education, out of the classroom, out of the world. And at the same time, he says, our work is also that of arousing a desire for wanting to be there, to wanting to live our lives together in this complex and, and messy world. And for me, this, this gives much more layers to this rather strict notion of Aufforderung, the summoning to, to be yourself, to not forget yourself. So there are all kinds of, of qualities that need to come into play. Um, Bertolt Brecht also understands something from it, so I finish with a quote from him, where he says, the modern theater mustn't be judged by its success in satisfying the audi audience's habits, by, by its success in transforming them. And I would say the same about a modern school. The modern school should not be a place where we just satisfy students as customers. The, the key question for education is always whether the, the desires and the habits that students have, whether they are worth pursuing or whether they need to be reconsidered and transformed. And the same with this, it needs to be questions not about whether it manages to interest the spectator in buying a ticket, just to have an interest in the performance, but it must be questions about whether it manages to interest the spectator in the world. And for me, this goes back to the idea that ultimately the center of our attention is there. And I think that there is a teacherly gesture, a pedagogy, a public pedagogy that can do that and therefore can cut through this unhelpful, either we fear teaching or we love teaching. There is a, a third option. That's as far as I got with my own reflections, so I hope they are a bit helpful, but again, I have uh, great confidence in the next four years in order to deepen and broaden and, and get precision in this uh, complicated, but I think really important discussion. So thanks for paying your attention to all this for now. Thank you.